be seated. We continue our series on the names of God. It's amazing as you look into scripture to determine and discover how many different names God has given to himself. And almost all of them take you back to the original name that God gives to himself in Exodus chapter 3, which we read just a few moments ago. I am that I am. The eternally present God. We find that as the root name, Yahweh, and that's the name that comes over to us in English as Jehovah, or in the King James text, it's translated with all capital letters, L-O-R-D, Lord. And we find that's a name that is compounded with many other names that are descriptive attributes of God himself that tell us about his character, about his person, about his work, about his plan, and about his love for us as sinners. We've been looking at the sixth compound name of God. We began there last week in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, the name Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. In Jeremiah 23, 6, we read, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. We saw last week that that's a very interesting context in which that verse is found because it is in the context of Jehovah being the shepherd and we had just finished looking at the name the Lord our shepherd from Psalm 23. And so here is God connecting the name the Lord our shepherd with the Lord our righteousness. He as the shepherd always does what he promises he will do. He is righteous. He does not lie to us, he does not fail us, he does not trick us, but he is the one who is the Lord our righteousness. And we saw the great prophecies of the Old Testament, how he will bring Israel back to the land. That's the context at the end of this passage. It begins with the Lord as the shepherd, it continues with the Lord our righteousness, and then it shows this great God bringing Israel from the farthest corners of the earth back to their land. It happened in 1948. Israel, having been in diaspora for nearly 2,000 years, scattered to the four winds of heaven, and as the scripture prophesied, Israel was born in a day. Pretty precise prophecies in the word of God. He is the one who is righteous, who keeps his promises. And so he has kept them to Israel, and so he will keep them to us as well. We saw how Paul spoke of these great promises to Israel in Romans chapter 11. He speaks of that day how right now blindness has happened in part unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And 11.26, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. The Lord our righteousness. It's wonderful that that is the God whom we serve, and we, we learn that Jesus Christ is the Lord our righteousness. Many passages that we looked at in the New Testament where that name is applied to him. You see, the scripture teaches that Jesus is Jehovah. It teaches that he is the creator. Now, you can choose not to believe that. You can choose to reject that. But you cannot say that is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Gospel of John opens up, within the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. That takes you back to Genesis 1. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You say, well, how do we know that that refers to Jesus? Jump down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. He's the one who becomes the theme of the Gospel of John. So you can reject it if you wish, though to your eternal peril. Or you can take what the Bible says, recognizing that God always keeps his promises, God is always true, and this one who is called the Lord our righteousness in the Old Testament is identified with the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. Very important to know that that is his character. And to know that that righteousness which he gives to those who place their faith in him is not a matter of their good works, but it is a matter of his grace. It is a gift. We tried to emphasize that at the offering time, but it is central to the gospel. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. The scripture is clear, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. When Christ comes into your life, he comes in with a transforming power that changes the way you think, that changes the way you talk, that changes the way you live, that changes your motivations, that changes everything about you that gives you a new desire for holy things, that gives you a new desire and a thirst and a hunger for the word of God. It's a transforming power. It's a renewing power. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 11. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He transforms us. He changes us from what we used to be to where suddenly we are glorifying God and living for Christ and growing into the likeness of Christ where we reflect him. When others see us, they see Jesus living through us. When others listen to our speech, they hear us giving God praise instead of using the name of Jesus as a curse word. Transforming power in God does it. You cannot earn your own salvation, and you become righteous in the sight of God by faith in Christ, who is the Lord our righteousness. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10.10, 10, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is a gift from God, and it is imputed to you, that it is transferred to your account, bookkeeping term transferred to your account by faith in Christ. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, Romans 1.17. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. How many of us are struggling to live life by our good deeds? Good deeds come from a genuine faith, but good deeds don't produce faith. Putting the cart before the horse will never get you there. We start at square one with faith in Christ, realizing he has done it all for us on Calvary, and then out of a heart filled with love and gratitude, we respond to his love, not trying to earn his love, but because we love. What a difference in our motives. We've talked about the prophetic future and the righteousness of Christ as the final judge. And we ended last week with remembering that name of God, the Lord our righteousness, a name of God that clearly refers to Jesus Christ. But we also just touched briefly on practical application. Now, dear people, it's nice to know good theology. Because lots of people have scrambled theology. They've never spent any time studying the Bible. And so they have all kinds of opinions on all kinds of things that they think God ought to do. And things that they think God probably did. But they have no way of knowing because they have not studied his word. They just have their own opinions. But 
all true theology is going to result in something about your life. Let me give you a principle. If you're a serious Christian, if you're serious about your walk with God, let me give you a seven-word principle that you need to think about and apply on a regular basis. Here it is, seven words. What you believe affects how you act. Short, simple. Let me say it again. What you believe affects how you act. Bad theology, consistently applied, will always lead to an ungodly, careless, and compromised lifestyle. True theology, truly believed, will always lead to a life of holiness and righteousness. Never forget that phrase. What you believe will always affect how you act. If that's the case, it's obviously absolutely essential to make sure that you believe truly biblical theology so that you will have a truly godly life of faith that pleases God. I think you all understand that you make decisions based on what you believe. It's uh, in real life. If you believe wrong, uh, it does have some consequences. And uh, in the realm of your moral life, it will lead you to sin if you believe what is wrong. It's, it's like sort of driving a car. It's like deciding to turn onto a road that you really believe leads to your destination. Only to find out later that <laughs> you're miles out of your way. And that road really didn't go where you thought that it was going to go. Now, you really believed, I mean, you had real faith. You really, really believed that turning onto that road would lead where you planned. If you didn't believe that, you would not have turned onto that road. But you were wrong. I think we've all been there. Having a strong belief is absolutely worthless if the content of your belief is wrong. Wrong decisions lead to wrong destinations. In theology, wrong decisions lead to sin. And if they're not corrected, they may eventually lead to hell. That's why the very first theological decision that you ever make is very critical. The first decision that you have to make is how do you get on the road to heaven? That's a really important question, isn't it? It doesn't make any difference if you're on the wrong road. What decisions you make after that? They're not going to get you there unless you go back to square one and make the right decision. You see, there is only one way according to Scripture, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, Jesus was either lying to us, or he was as loony as uh, the idiot who thinks that he looks nice with a poached egg on his ear, or some other worse thing than that, perhaps demonic, or he's telling us the truth. Now, you're going to have to make that decision. Is that the road you want to go down? Or do you want to choose a different road? The road of humanism, the road of good works, the road of religion. There are lots of other roads out there. And they all have signs saying, come this way. We have lots of promises at our road. But there is only one road, according to the Bible, that leads to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. That's a road. If you want to get to heaven, you have to come by Jesus. There is no other way. There is no one else who died for our sins and who was buried and then who rose from the dead the third day, proving that his promise about forgiveness of sin is true. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Either that or the Bible is totally wrong. Now you've got to make a choice. You can walk out of here today and say, you know, that was nice, 
to hear that. I wish the sermon had been a little bit shorter, but, um, you know, hey, it was fun to be there and uh, did something I don't do and, you know, but I don't, I don't buy it. You can do that. The decision you make concerning the road you get on will lead somewhere. Where is it that you want to go? You will die someday. We all do. Unless our Lord Jesus Christ comes back, as he has promised that he will do someday, and we see ourselves living in a world that is very parallel to what the scripture describes as the last days. If he comes back first, it's important to be ready. But if the hearse comes first, it's also important to be ready. So here's the place you start making decisions. Will you or will you not trust Christ? He died for your sins and paid for all of them. Look back over your life, you think about it. Then you try to add up, you know, I wonder if I have enough good works to cancel out that sin that I did. Oh man, I just remembered that sin over there. You know, well, I did help a little old lady across the street once. I, I did donate to the Salvation Army bucket outside the, the Walmart, uh, you know, at Christmas. Uh, I wonder how much that counts as I think about that sin. Dear people, your good works could never outweigh your sins because that's not a road to heaven. But Jesus died for your sins. Christ died for you when you were in an ungodly state. Christ, who is perfectly righteous, paid the penalty for your sins. The wrath of God was borne by our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross for your sins, for my sins. And what we need to do is say, thank you, God. I accept his sacrifice in my place because I know, I believe in my heart that he rose from the dead, which proves that your offer of salvation is true. Ah, oh, friend, don't wait one more day. Make today the day of your new birth by faith in Christ. That's the first decision. But you know, every time we make decisions from then on, it's also going to affect things in our lives. Either those decisions will be based on an accurate understanding of the Bible, or those decisions will be based on the ideas of men. Remember, what you believe affects how you act. If you believe that there is no God, then you'll act in accordance with that, thinking there will never be accountability. If you believe that you are evolved from slime, you will logically come to the conclusion <laughs> then there is no such thing as a moral standard. It doesn't matter how I act. Remember that phrase, what you believe affects how you act. Consciously think about it. Every time you make a decision, it will begin to have an impact on your life. Look at your life and the decisions you're making. First, do you know that you're on the road to heaven for sure? Second, once you are saved according to God's terms, that is, on the right road of salvation through faith in Christ, are your decisions leading to a life of holiness, purity, an earnest desire to please the Savior? Are those decisions giving a clear testimony for Christ? Remember, what you really believe affects how you act. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. How imputed righteousness of Christ should be affecting our lives here in the present. Romans 6, beginning in verse 13. Neither yield ye your members, as that is, the members of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Every time you make a decision, you're making a decision one way or the other as it relates to that verse. 
You're going to yield your members, what you look at, what you listen to, what you smell, what you taste, what goes into your body, what you touch, what you do with the different organs of your body and the members of your body, is going to be based on whether or not you have yielded those members to Christ, to glorify him in every action of life. You see, there's practical application for theological truth. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Think about the situation of slavery. A man who is a slave does what his master commands him to do. Now, it's a hideous institution. But as it is still practiced in many parts of the world today, there are many Muslims who have slaves in the various countries where they control. And the slave trade is still going on in different parts of the world, though mostly hush-hush. And there is slavery in the world of prostitution where women and girls and even little boys are kidnapped and sold as slaves. It happens in the United States, folks. Major rings have recently been broken up that were involved in that slave traffic. The one who is the slave does what the master tells him or her to do or suffer brutal consequences. If you are unsaved, you do what your master, the flesh, tells you to do. That is what controls you, and so you yield your members as members of unrighteousness unto sin. But if you are saved, you have a gracious master, the Lord Jesus Christ, one who loved you enough to die for you. Can you imagine the master dying for a slave? And with joy and thanksgiving and with love, for this is a good master, you yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You see, that's what Paul's talking about. If you have the imputed righteousness of Christ, if he has made you righteous in the sight of God by his shed blood on the cross, taking away your sins... Is that not cause for an expression of love and obedience and service to the one who loved you so? Paul goes on. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. You see, when you trust Christ, it gets rid of that old slave master. The one who was always motivating you to sin. Now, he still hangs around. He still tries to boss you around every now and then. You still get those thoughts. You still get those impulses. You still get those drives. But you don't have to obey them. Because Christ is your new master if you've trusted him. You can just say no. And you'll have the power by the Spirit of God to say no. And to do no. Oh, what freedom that is. To be able to say no when before you never could say no. That's the power and the freedom that comes when you place your faith in Jesus alone. When you make those decisions on a daily basis. Now sometimes we go back under that old slave master. Sometimes we go back and we go ahead and sin and then we're, we have mortified consciences. We feel grief and sorrow. And we have to come crawling back to our master, the Lord Jesus, and say... I sinned. Please forgive me. How wonderful it is to know that the scripture tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how big the death of Christ is. It's not an excuse to sin. But the promise of God when we as his children disobey him. 
That's a God who's a God of grace. We don't deserve it, but he provides it. Paul goes on. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity, that means the weakness of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. <laughs> when you were the slave of sin, you didn't do anything that was righteous. In fact, at that time, what you thought was righteous was in the sight of God, according to the prophet Isaiah, was like filthy rags. All our righteousnesses, he says, are as filthy rags. The word translated filthy rags is the word menstruous cloth. It shows that conception has not taken place. That there has not been the seed of the word of God entered the heart, nor has a new birth occurred. That's what human righteousness is like in the sight of God. The only righteousness that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, our righteousness, the only righteousness that he accepts is divine righteousness, and that is what Christ has provided through his death on the cross, and he gives to us who have placed our faith in him, he gives us his righteousness as a gift. We are clothed with Christ, the scripture describes it, gives us that picture of being in Christ, the one who is righteous. Are you there? Do you know it for sure? Have you trusted Christ alone, who is our righteousness? Ah, oh, dearly beloved, there is no place else that is safe. It is only in Jesus. It is only in Jesus. You start by making a decision which road you're going to go down, which road you're going to trust for eternity, which road you're going to trust to get you to heaven, which road you're going to trust so that when they put you in a casket and you have reached that destination, you know that you've come to the end of the right road. Are you ready? The decisions that we make in life Verse 23, you all know Romans 6, 23. Most people in the world who have just barely touched Christianity know Romans 6, 23. This verse is in the context that I've just been reading in Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Which road are you on? Which road are you traveling and thinking it's going to get you to the right destination? Remember, there's only one. What you believe will affect the way that you act. There's another very important principle that is given to us in Scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, you know, we normally think of that in terms of marriage, and it clearly applies to marriage. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A Christian should not marry a non-Christian. And sadly, and I have seen this in more than 40 years of ministry, that there are many true Christians who are in miserable marriages because they violated that principle. There are. Perhaps you know some, where one real believer is married to a pagan, to someone who pretended to be a Christian but turned out not to be a Christian. I'm talking about real Christians. I'm not talking about people who are church members. I'm talking about real Christians according to the salvation that we've just discussed. We warn our young people 
that there is no such thing as evangelistic dating. You know, some girl gets invited out by a guy, and the girl's a Christian, and she thinks, man, he is really cute. <laughs> you know, and there's some cute guys out there, girls. Or maybe the guy is a real Christian, and the sweetest thing that ever touched this side of earth goes walking by and winks at him. And he melts into a puddle of jelly on the ground. And he thinks, well, yeah, but I, I know she's not a Christian. But I'll try to lead her to Christ. So he asks her out. Dear friends, that is really dangerous. Girls, that is really dangerous to go out with a guy that you know is not a Christian. It's deadly, as a matter of fact. There is no such thing as evangelistic dating like a steel trap. Your emotions are going to snap shut on you and you will begin to rationalize what a great person this unsaved person is, that great boyfriend, that great girlfriend. And then finally the Holy Spirit will convict you that you ought not to be doing this and not going down what he or she wants you to start doing. You're going to go through all kinds of agony and pain in your emotions as you try to break up before you ever go into that horrible pain, make sure that that boy or girl is truly qualified in the eyes of God. Because, you know, human emotions run faster than a cheetah. And it's nearly impossible to think clearly. I mean, I know young people who've gone through this. Nearly impossible to think clearly once your emotions are involved in it. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And here's our phrase, remember Christ is your righteousness. And you in him are made righteous and you are to be living a righteous life because of that. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? But you know that prohibition against an unequal yoke also applies to business partnerships. You know, here the temptation is another one of our basic human desires covetousness or greed, that is to make a lot of money. That's a tough one for some people to deal with. We all need money to some extent just to survive. But along comes some unbeliever with a perfect business deal that you know is just going to make a whole lot of money. So you're tempted to throw in your lot with that guy or that woman and rake in the cash. Now, you know, I've practiced law for more than 20 years at this point in addition to being a pastor. And I've seen people trying to put together business deals. And I've helped some who are Christians, and I've told others I won't help them because of the way in which it's structured and who they are dealing with. Um, I've seen this, where they try to put together a business deal with an unbeliever. And you know, in every case, there's going to be something in that business deal that is a little bit shady. Believers need to stay away from that kind of stuff altogether, totally, 100%. Stay away from it. First of all, because the scripture says so, and secondly, because it never works. You will end up either compromising your theological position and your practical lifestyle, or else something will go wrong. Scripture says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So if you're tempted to throw in your lot with them... Remember Proverbs chapter 1. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lick privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up as the grave, alive and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. Look, we're going to make a lot of money at this. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Man, we're going to get a bigger house. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. That's a business deal, folks. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. You know, it's not merely in the New Testament. This is Old Testament principle too. God wants his people to be distinct. He wants us to have a clear-cut testimony so that there is never any question about the way we do our businesses. Not just business deals in general, but it's a prohibition against any kind of joint ventures. Currently, one of our Bible Presbyterian national pastors in Kenya is under discipline for entering into a joint venture with a Muslim. 
You see, this principle applies to church membership and affiliation. If you're part of a liberal denomination or an apostate church, certainly includes separation from cultic groups. It applies to promoting, supporting, or helping in any way the agenda of an apostate group. In fact, it applies to every area of life. If you have been made righteous in Christ, you are supposed to be living for Christ. We've been called out to be separate. You've got it right there. Be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6.17. That's in the same context that I've just read this verse, verse 14, out of uh, among them. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You see, true cleansing by the blood of Christ and true theology will result in a moral cleansing and a growing holiness whereby we will have a greater fear of the Lord. What you believe, now if you don't believe that, this won't happen. But what you believe will affect the way you act. If you don't take that principle seriously, you won't make any effort to avoid unequal yokes in any area of your life. And you know, you'll soon be in trouble. I'm going to close with one illustration I have much more to go, but the time is almost up. Some of you have heard of Dr. Carl McIntyre. <laughs> I certainly hope so. He founded this church. Dr. Carl McIntyre graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary with another man named Dr. Harold John Ockengay. Dr. Ockengay was the pastor of Park Street Congregational Church in Boston, later became the president of Conwell Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and Gordon College. My senior year at Gordon, he became the president there. And uh, so I had personal contact with him. He's the man who is known as the father of neo evangelicalism. He chose to go one way, and Dr. McIntyre chose to go the other way. I chose to go the way that Dr. McIntyre went. But Dr. Ockengay, along with Billy Graham and others, decided that. Instead of being separate from apostasy and compromise, that it was better to hold hands and try to win them back over. Sort of like evangelistic dating with boys and girls. And they were willing to call the apostates in the liberal denominations brother if those apostates would call them Dr. So and so. And they seemed to be getting along quite famously. It has resulted in the decline and destruction of a great deal of evangelicalism today, where all sorts of horrifying compromises have entered the churches. Because they did not obey this principle, they did not understand the practical application of Christ our righteousness to the way in which we as Christians are to live separated from compromise and evil and moral decay and depravity. And so that has come into those churches. It started on the theological level, but what you believe affects what you do. Ah, oh, dear friends, it will also affect whether or not you will hear these words when someday you stand before the Lord, our righteousness, it will affect whether or not you hear these words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Those are the words that Jesus said will be spoken to those who have obeyed him. It will also largely determine whether or not you receive any of the glorious heavenly rewards promised to those who have trusted Christ and who have obeyed him by faith. This principle of Christ our righteousness applied to Christ our righteousness in real life applies to anything that comes to us as a temptation under the three headings that you know so well, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that is sex, greed, and power and position. How often we're willing to compromise just to satisfy one of those three areas. And so we float into a wishy-washy theology that permits us to disobey. What you truly believe will affect what you do. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that Christ, our righteousness, is the one who has made us righteous by his cleansing blood. That he died for our sins, all that is unrighteous in our lives. He paid the full penalty for it. He took our place, suffering the wrath of God on Calvary's cross. Not merely to give us a fire escape to heaven, but to give us eternal life, a life that is filled with joy and peace, a life that is filled with holiness, because we respond to the one who loved us in the way that pleases him. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior, that you will draw them to the foot of the cross. Cause them to see who Jesus really is. That he is the Lord, our righteousness. And that our own righteousness is, in your sight, is but filthy rags. And that he will wash us clean. He will clothe us in his righteousness. We will be seen in Christ as we stand before you. And as you see us in him... What joy and delight there will be both for our Heavenly Father, you, our gracious God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and for us, knowing that we are safe and secure in the one who loved us so. Father, your word is eternal. It is infinite. It is supernaturally powerful. We pray that you will take it today as it has been proclaimed, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.